Hello. Today we're going to discuss periodic forcing of nonlinear systems and some ideas behind chaos. First, let's review some ideas from before about nonlinear systems in three dimensions. Let's consider a three dimensional system of the form dx dt equals f of t x y z, dy dt equals g of t x y z, and dz dt equals h of t x y z. We'll say that such a system is autonomous if f, g, and h are not functions of time t. We'll say that a point capital Y sub zero is an equilibrium point if f evaluated at this point is zero, g evaluated at this point is zero, and h evaluated at this point is zero. We'd like to classify such equilibrium points as either saddles, sinks, sources, or spirals. The idea is to perform a Taylor series expansion around this point to find a linearized system. That is, we'd like to express once we're very close to this equilibrium point, our three-dimensional system as a three-dimensional linear system of the form dy dt equals a times y. Here, a is a three by three matrix that we can express in terms of the coefficients a, i, j, all expressed in terms of partial derivatives of our functions f, g, and h evaluated at this equilibrium point. This means that we are interested in how to solve such a three-dimensional linear system. We can do so by breaking up into three different cases. If A is a diagonalizable matrix, then there exists a basis of eigenvectors for A. This means that the general solution to our three-dimensional linear system is a linear combination of straight line solutions of the form y of t equals e to the lambda t times b. Here, lambda is an eigenvalue, and v is the corresponding eigenvector. If A is not a diagonalizable matrix, then we have two cases. The first case is if our matrix A has two distinct eigenvalues. In this case, the characteristic polynomial factors as lambda minus lambda 1 squared times lambda minus lambda 2. We can find a basis consisting of eigenvectors v1 and v2, as well as a generalized eigenvector w1. For instance, if v1 is the eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda 1, then the generalized eigenvector w1 satisfies a minus lambda 1 times i3 times the vector w1 equals the eigenvector v1. In this case, the general solution of our three-dimensional linear system is a linear combination of two straight line solutions, as well as a new solution of the form e to the lambda 1t times t times v1 plus w1. Finally, in the case where our matrix A has only one eigenvalue, the characteristic polynomial factors as lambda minus lambda 1 cubed. We can find a basis consisting of an eigenvector v1 as well as two generalized eigenvectors, w1 and w2. Here, w1 satisfies the equation a, a minus lambda 1 i3 times w1 equals v1, and a minus lambda 1 i3 times w2 equals w1. In this case, the general solution is a linear combination of a straight line solution, e to the lambda 1 t times v1, a solution similar to what we found in the previous case, e minus lambda 1t times t times v1 plus w1, and finally a new solution of the form e to the lambda 1t times t squared over 2 times v1 plus t times w1 plus w2. Today we're going to discuss periodic forcing of nonlinear systems. To get an idea of what this means, let's first return to the forced harmonic oscillator. We can express this in the form y double prime plus p times y prime plus q times y equals maybe some forcing function epsilon cosine omega t. Here we would think of epsilon, the forcing amplitude, as a small non-negative number. Assuming that our coefficients p and q satisfy p squared minus 4q is negative, then we see that the roots of the characteristic polynomial are complex. We've expressed these roots of the form lambda equals alpha plus beta times i. 
In this case, we can express the general solution of the forced harmonic oscillator in the form some constant k1 times e to the alpha t cosine beta t plus a constant k2 times e to the alpha t sine beta t plus a times cosine omega t minus v. Here, capital A is the amplitude coming from this forcing, and phi is the phase angle. Assuming that this system is undamped, that is p is equal to zero, we can write q as beta squared. Here, beta is just the natural frequency we found coming from the roots of the characteristic polynomial, and the phase angle phi is equal to zero, so that the general solution now reduces to a slightly simpler function. y of t equals k1 times cosine beta t plus k2 times sine beta t plus epsilon divided by beta squared minus omega squared times cosine omega t. Here we are assuming that the forcing frequency omega is different from the natural frequency beta so that we're not at resonance. We can express this second order differential equation as a two-dimensional system. That is, we could define dy dt as a new function v, so that dv dt equals negative beta squared times y plus epsilon cosine omega t. Notice that when epsilon is equal to zero, we have a Hamiltonian system. That is, we can let f be the variable v and let g be negative beta squared times y, so that f is the partial of some function h with respect to v, and g is negative the partial of some function h with respect to y. Here we can think of h as the total energy of the system. h is 1 half beta squared y squared plus 1 half v squared. Observe that when we have h of y v equals some constant c, then we have level curves. And in fact, the plots of these level curves are just circles and ellipses. Here you can see a graph of some examples on your screen. On the lower left, we have a plot when epsilon is equal to zero. Here we simply have a harmonic oscillator that is not forced and it is undamped. So we simply express the phase plane as a series of circles. On the other hand, looking at the lower right hand part, for small epsilon, we see that we're not quite at a nice periodic function that here it seems that our solution wobbles a little bit around the circle that we had for the lower left. The idea here is that if we simply apply a small forcing term, that is a forcing term that has a small angle, then we expect the solution to look very much like the solution when there is no forcing, but there'll just be small wobbles around that solution. A German engineer named Georg Duffing was very interested in having a slight generalization of the forced harmonic oscillator. In 1918, he was interested in the equation that you see here on your screen, y double prime plus p times y prime plus q times y plus r times y cubed equals epsilon cosine omega t. As before, we'll think of this forcing amplitude epsilon as a small non-negative number. We call this equation the Duffing oscillator. This is because this reduces to the forced harmonic oscillator when r is equal to zero. Observe that, just like before, we can identify p as the damping coefficient, q as the spring constant, and now r we'll think of as the non-linearity in the restoring force. In practice, we'll usually assume that p squared minus 4q is negative, and r is less than or equal to zero, to model now a nonlinear forced harmonic oscillator. Just like with the harmonic oscillator, we can express the second order differential equation as a two dimensional nonlinear system. We have dy dt equals v, so that dv dt equals negative p times v minus q times y plus r times y cubed plus epsilon cosine omega t. And as with the forced harmonic oscillator, we'll assume today that our system is undamped. That is, we'll set p equal to zero. Just like with the forced harmonic oscillator we discussed a few slides ago, when epsilon is equal to zero, we have a Hamiltonian system. That is, let's let f equal v 
and g equal negative q times y minus r times y cubed. Then f is the partial of some function h with respect to the velocity v, and g is negative the partial of h with respect to our displacement y. Here, h we can write as 1 half qy squared plus 1 fourth r y to the fourth plus 1 half v squared. Since q is assumed to be positive, remember our assumption that p squared minus 4q is negative, we can set q is equal to beta squared. This reminisces back to the exact same situation we just dealt with a few moments ago with the forced harmonic oscillator. Let's also denote r as equal to negative beta squared divided by lambda squared for some lambda. We'll write it this way to see that there now must be three equilibrium points for our system, namely the origin and plus or minus lambda comma zero. It's easy to check that the origin is a center because we have complex eigenvalues for the Jacobian matrix at this point. Whereas the other equilibrium point, lambda comma zero, must be a saddle because the eigenvalues of our Jacobian are real numbers, namely plus or minus the square root of two times beta. Here you can see on your screen a plot of the phase plane. The three blue dots in the middle are our equilibrium points. You can see that the one dot exactly in the middle of the graph, namely zero comma zero, is a center, whereas the two that flag this point on the left and the right, namely negative lambda comma zero and positive lambda comma zero, are both saddles. We're motivated by the following question. Now that we have an idea of what the equilibrium points are, and we've classified them, and we have a better idea of what the phase plane looks like, this all works for epsilon is equal to zero. What can we say about the solutions y of t for small epsilon that are not equal to zero? To recap, we're going to focus on solutions here to the Duffing oscillator, where we'll set p is equal to zero, q is equal to beta squared, again, think of beta perhaps as the natural frequency, and r equal to negative beta squared over lambda squared. We make these substitutions so that our three equilibrium points are negative lambda comma zero, zero comma zero, and positive lambda comma zero. Recall that y is the displacement and v is the velocity. This means that we can plot solutions y of t versus time t and v of t versus time t. You can see a couple of examples of these on the lower left-hand part of your screen. Of course, we also take a look at the phase plane, so we could plot out points capital Y of t as lowercase y of t comma v of t. Actually, we're interested to keep track of all three of these at the same time. So to do this, we're now going to take a look at plots in three-dimensional space. That is, we have the time axis t, the displacement axis y, and the velocity axis v. Remember that the forcing function g of t is in the form epsilon times cosine omega t. This is a periodic forcing that has period capital T, which is 2 pi divided by omega. Remember that omega here is just the forcing frequency. So we'd like to measure whether our solution, capital Y of t, is also a periodic function with the same period. Notice here on the graph at the top of the screen, we made special attention to the points where we have t is equal to zero, t is equal to two pi over omega, t is equal to four pi over omega, and t is equal to six pi over omega. These are the small rounded blue dots that you see here on, on the screen as we try to plot out our solutions in three dimensions. We want to pay close attention to how these dots move around as our t moves through the various integer multiples of the period. As we move through the various integer multiples of the period, we really like to keep track of whether our solution, capital Y of t, stays at the same point or whether it moves to a different point. As we move to different points, we will call this the Poincaré return map. On the next few screens, we'll plot out the Poincaré return maps for several choices of the initial point capital Y of t0 that is very close to one of our two saddle points, namely negative lambda comma zero or positive lambda comma zero. 
Notice that in the following few screens, as the forcing amplitude epsilon increases, the behavior of the Poincaré return map becomes less and less predictable. This is known as chaos. Here's an example where the forcing amplitude epsilon is equal to zero. You can see here that it appears that once we take a look at random initial points, capital Y of T zero, that eventually the solution seems to congregate around what almost looks like an eye here on the screen. Notice that of course what's happening is everything seems to congregate roughly around the center here of the graph, namely the origin zero comma zero. Now let's increase the forcing amplitude just a little bit. Now our amplitude epsilon is 0 0.033. You can see here that even though we're starting somewhere near the two saddle points, that now as the solution increases over time, it's no longer sitting around the center point. It seems to be a little bit diffuse around different points here in the region. Let's increase our forcing amplitude even more. Now, epsilon is equal to 0 0.066. Again, you can see how the points seem to be almost scattered all around the graph. And finally, if we can increase our forcing amplitude even more, epsilon here equals 0 0.1, now you can see that the points that we have in our Poincaré return map seem to be all over the place. This is the phenomenon known as chaos. Thanks very much for watching.